I have some friends who by quirk of their birth are citizens of two countries. They have passports from two countries. Uh, a friend of mine has a passport from Brazil and the United States. Another one, a passport from France and the United States. I've never understood the advantage of being a citizen of more than one country. Do you have to pay taxes in both countries? That never made any sense to me. But for some reason, uh, maybe the character of my friends, they were really proud that they were the citizens of two countries. And then you find yourself having to deal with the same problem. As a follower of Christ, we have to deal with this challenge of dual citizenship. Being a citizen of the United States of America and a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now, how does that work? Does it work? Well, gratefully, we're not the first people to have to deal with this. The early church dealt with it. In fact, the letter of 1 Peter deals with it almost uh, exclusively. So what did the early church say about the predicament of a dual citizenship? Stand with me in honor of God's word. And we'll pick up in this very familiar passage in 1 Peter. Chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage, so, that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day that he visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. It is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Oftentimes, we are stuck between a rock and a hard place. So we pray, Father, that you would give us wisdom, discernment, courage, faithfulness that people would indeed see our good works, our offerings of worship and service to you and praise you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. A lot of times when you read scripture, if you're not careful, you'll get whiplash. That is, you'll think the, reader, the writer is going one way and then all of a sudden he will quickly turn and snap you back to another one. This is what, what Peter does here. The paragraph before, the sentence before, we all know. We love, right? You remember it. Chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his possession. Once you were no people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Right? We love those words. We want to cross-stitch them, put them on our refrigerator door. And then the next one. Therefore, brothers and sisters, friends, I urge you, I implore you as strangers, someone who doesn't know the language, someone who doesn't know the culture, someone who grew up somewhere else, stranger. Have you ever been a stranger? Have you ever gotten off a plane in a different nation, different language, different culture? You didn't know when to stand up, didn't know when to sit down, didn't know which fork to use? That's us. Exile, someone who has been forcibly removed 
from society. We don't want you here. Not only do we not want you here, we don't want you to ever come back. So you are exiled. A person without a country. A person without a home. Strangers and exiles. Royal priesthood. God's own people. Receivers of his mercy. Strangers and exiles. Well, this was written to a church dealing with the reality of how you be a Christian in the Roman Empire. It could very easily have been written to us today. How are we to be Christians in the United States of America? We live in a very challenging and difficult time. So I thought I'd call in an expert. Y'all welcome to the platform, my friend, Stephen Mansfeld. Stephen? Stephen Mansfield is a uh, world-known speaker, author, all of that, and somehow you had nothing to do on the 4th of July and you ended uh, up here. That's right, right, that's right. So, An expert's just a guy 50 miles out of town with a briefcase. That's all that expert right. is. So. We have, uh, and this is a, a common conversation between you and me, uh, the challenge we have as being followers of Christ uh, in, in the situation that is now uh, going on in our culture and society when, when it seems there is a turning uh, uh, and the church is facing growing hostility. So uh, give us the, uh, a quick overview of, of the, the circumstances we now find ourselves in. Well, what's gone on, as you all know, is that those of us who lived in America and those of us who were believers, uh, the two kingdoms we were citizens of, as we've read in the passage this morning, went for the most part in parallel. There were some conflicts, but they went for the most part in parallel. But now they're two kingdoms in conflict, aren't they? Everybody in the room feels that. Uh, we love our country. Uh, like, I don't mind telling you very quickly, my ancestors dot are buried all throughout the military cemeteries in this country. Uh, my father was a high-ranking army officer. My brother-in-law fought, I mean, I could just go on and on and on. My doctorate's in American history. I love, I love this country. Uh, but I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so what's happened is we have felt the tension happening as the two kingdoms we are citizens of have turned in conflict, and it's throwing us into difficulty. We, 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 we many of us were raised, I certainly was, uh, singing the songs of patriotism, flags in the home, flags in the church in some cases. You understand what I'm talking about. But now those things symbolize something different. So people who are committed to Jesus, people who are citizens of the kingdom of God, people who want to do God's will, it's not as though we abandon our country. It's not as though we hate our country. It's not as though we want to burn it down. But we are in conflict. And I love the passage that Mike has chosen because it points us towards uh, going ahead and acknowledge the pilgrim. These are the other words that are used in that passage. Pilgrim, alien status that we feel, but serve. So we have this dual calling to be both people who see ourselves as a holy nation, both people who see ourselves as the kingdom of God, and yet we are meant to be as much in the muck and the mire and on the streets serving as any people on earth. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but it's what we're called to do. And I don't mean to bring bad news on this morning of the good news of the gospel, but it's going to get worse in this country. It's going to get worse. We're going to be more in tension. So we've got to be clear about who we are, clear about our pillars, uh, clear about what kingdom we belong to, and clear about our radical commitment to serve in this generation. Okay. What can, uh, what are our obligations, our responsibilities as citizens of the kingdom? To the, to the earthly to, kingdom? To, to yeah. the it's, United States. In this passage that Mike has brought us to, it's, it's pretty strong. We're supposed to submit. We're supposed to pray. We're supposed to honor them. Well, you know, I can bring a whole lot of folks from D.C. where I live half the year into this room, and you're going to go, oh, I'm not sure I want to honor him. I mean, I feel the same way, right? You understand what I'm talking about. I watch cable news just like you do. It's a choice between honor, dishonor, honor, dishonor. But we're called to honor them all who are in authority over us. We're called to pray for them. We're called to submit to them. That's tough. And then we're called to radically serve. So we are to think of ourselves as pilgrims who are in a given place at a given time but on a journey somewhere else. And while we're in that place at a given time, we're meant to be serving. Uh, so we pray for our country. We love our country. We remember, remember our heritage. 
Uh, we remember the great parts of it, but we also embrace the negatives. I've done some writing recently on the Tulsa riot of uh, earlier in our American history and the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. I understand why my African American friends are ups uh, upset. And the kingdom of God, the kingdom of a God who enthrones himself amongst all the races and tribes and tongues and nations, that kingdom is sensitive to the plight of a suffering people. That, that nation is sensitive to um, the, the challenges of all ethnicities. So, so in a sense, we are meant to bear the burdens of an age we don't feel fully part of. And that's part of the challenge that we have. We're not, if you are feeling less comfortable in your country this morning, welcome to being a citizen primarily of the kingdom while living in modern America. That you, in other words, you're, 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 you're feeling the right thing. If you're feeling super comfortable in your country this morning, that's when I would be worried about you. Okay. Um, you say submit. Yes. Okay. I, and I, I read it. I know what it means and all of that. I'm, I'm just not a real good submitter. We you know. Knew, at, we you knew know, that about you. Actually, actually, we is, that that a, is that news to y'all? I'm, I'm just not a real good submitter. And so sometimes when uh, I see uh, a, a law passed, a rule given that in my mind is just stupid, Um, what, 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 do I, what do I do? Well, bear in mind that, again, the passage that Mike took us to, which is the Word of God, was written at a time when the church was dealing with the Roman Empire. Now, it's bad today, yeah. and all, but it's and, not and the all, And all of it's paganism. And all of it's paganism. Yeah. By the way, it's very possible that Nero was the emperor being referenced. Nero was a pervert. Nero made his horse a senator. Nero was nuts. Um, so we're, you, you think you've got a problem with the guy who got elected at whatever, you know, governor somewhere or to the, to the Senate. Nobody, nobody in D.C., nobody in the state capitol is as bad as Nero. Yet they were called to submit and honor and pray. So there is absolutely a place for making our contrary wishes known. There's actual, absolutely a place for protest. There's absolutely a place for forcefully expressing our views. But it is without question that ultimately Christians are called to comply, submit to the government. Now, if we are pushed up against radical, um, a, a call to radically disobey what God has commanded us to do. I mean, we see the apostles saying in the New Testament, whether we should obey God or man, you tell us. You, you look at the, the dilemma that we are in. So we're going to ultimately obey God. Most of the stuff that we're upset about, most of the stuff we think is stupid, uh, is not a matter of, of forcing us to disobey the law of God. It's just something we're upset about. So we've got to be careful to distinguish the two. We've got to be careful to this. If I'm ever forced by the government to kill somebody, of course, I won't do that. And then the, the, then the chips will fall where they, they may. So it, there is a radical message in Scripture that I wrestle with like Mike does, and that is we are called to submit to the government. Romans 13, this passage, without question. In fact, Romans 13, imagine, imagine how radical it is. It tells us that the governing authorities are established by God. And those early Christians could have said, wait a minute, I've been watching CNN and I can see what's happening in Rome. Uh, I, I'm not going to submit to that. That's the conundrum that we're in, and yet that's the commandment of the Lord. Sorry, Mike. Just is, I'm going to find another church. I know you are. Find another church. Right. Find another Fine. Bible if you want to, but that's what's on the page. <laughs> All right. What does our country need from the church right now? Well, it's going to sound like I'm trying to preach, but in the, in the simplest terms, it needs to see Jesus. It needs to see a church that cares more about what's going on in people's lives than other people do, than the rest of society does. It doesn't need to see, and I, I'm not trying to wait an argument here, it doesn't need to see a primarily political church. It doesn't need to see a primarily angry church. It doesn't need to see a primarily uh, any particular color or ethnicity of church. It needs to see the church exactly as for the First Peter passage tells us, that is serving, that is caring, that is washing feet, that is tending people, that is helping the wounded, that is healing society while pointing people to God. Um, I work in D.C. I'm often talking to congressmen and senators. 
when I tell them, I, I often don't tell them up front that I'm a Christian because I want them to figure it out by fruit. You know, it's the, it's the message of Mother Teresa, preach the gospel and use words if you must, you know. In other words, let your actions speak of whether you're a believer or not. Because in D.C., they're skittish about re- religious people. They're skittish about certainly evangelicals. I don't know if you know, we've become almost in some cases the lepers in D.C. because of the way some evangelicals have behaved and some myths that are out there. So what we've got to do is blow past the labels by serving and being, and being radically loving and showing them a God and showing them a people they've never seen before. That's what the nation needs. And yes, it needs us to be politically active. Yes, it needs us to speak the truth. Yes, it needs us to calmly uh, articulate our values and sometimes in non-religious terms. This nation desperately needs the people of God to be the true people of God. Yeah, okay. I, as an individual, we talk about the church. How should I be living? What, what counsel would you give me as somebody who's in the work day every week, who's having to deal with some of um, uh, the education or professional education that we're getting that isn't uh, aligned with what we, what we would know would, would be biblical truth? Well, God will put you in situations. He'll put you, he places you in your career. He places you around the people and in the institutions that you're in. And he, and he wants you to be not angry, calm, loving, but at the same time, speak the truth. Speak the truth. Uh, you're able to be a change agent there. I realize that some of you are in very difficult circumstances. You work for state agencies. You work in the public schools. There are things you can't say. There are things that you're, you're challenged about. Be calm. Be peaceful. Know that God has has called you for such time as this and lovingly speak truth. If you're you're in public schools and things are challenged and and, and there there are a lot of values floating around you don't agree with, be be the best teacher there if you possibly can. Speak your truth calmly. Uh, You know, don't blow stuff up. Don't threaten. Don't don't go crazy, hard, right, left, wing, whatever you are. Just be calm. Let them see Jesus. That is the thing we're going to have to do. We'll have our conflicts. God will put us in situations where we have conflicts. Some of us may be removed from our jobs in time because of what we believe. We know conflict is coming. But don't bring it on. Don't egg it on. Uh, and certainly don't let the defining issue of your life, the issue that brings the conflict, be some political opinion. Let it be about the gospel. Let it be about Jesus. Let it be about who you truly are. Um, we're not called to die on the cross or to die in this generation for minor principles of politics that are a matter of our preference. Uh, we are called to live our life before the world for Jesus Christ. I tell you all the time that if you walk into a room and flip the light on, and the light bulb blows out, you don't say the darkness killed another light bulb. You say the light bulb failed. If our country is dark, it is not because darkness is one. It's because the light has failed. Um, you and I are called, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Uh, to be those kind of difference makers uh, that happen wherever you work, wherever you're in school, whatever neighborhood uh, you, you live in. Uh, you, you do uh, run in a, a different circle than, than a lot of us do. You're with people of power and, and all that. Um, how do we best pray for the emperor? Pray with compassion and not anger. Pray, you know, when you intercede for people, Realize that right, left, or center, with you or not, their lives are difficult. One of the things I have most learned by working with powerful people in political governments, kings, prime ministers, is that they are dealing with the same things the average guy at Kmart and Walmart are, uh, the average guys are. Um, they've got the problems with the children. They've got addiction situations. They've got marital challenges. And by the way, they've got far more temptations than most of us ever face. And so... Pray, try to find, ask the Lord to give you compassion for them. We are commanded to pray for people we don't like. Come on, let's own up. We are commanded to pray for people we don't like. But Lord, I'm going to pray for them anyway. And I'm asking you to give compassion. And one of the, one of the days I was humorously irritated with God was when I teared up 
uh, being deeply moved, praying for somebody I didn't like when I started praying, and the Lord gave me compassion I didn't even want. You know what I'm talking about? Now I'm like, here I am crying for this joker. I really want him to die, but I'm going to pray for him and and intercede for him anyway. That's what Jesus wants to do because he wants to break our hearts for the folks that uh, we we wouldn't have natural compassion for. So ask the Lord. You know it's what he wants to do. Ask the Lord to give you compassion for the people you pray for, and then realize They've got the same struggles you do, the same insecurities, the same hurts, the same temptations, and it's all on a massive scale. This is the will of the Lord for us, that we pray. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stephen mentioned Mother Teresa. Around here we call it the Mother Teresa rule. The Mother Teresa rule is this. Go to places in culture where nobody wants to go and do what nobody wants to do. She went to, uh, to Mumbai in India and worked with lepers. Nobody in the town wanted to work with lepers. Nobody said a word to her. And by that ministry to the lepers, the the Lord gave her a worldwide platform. Okay? Where in your neighborhood, where in your sphere of influence does nobody want to go? What is it in your life that nobody wants to do. Start there and see how the Lord will give you the platform to give word uh, to his truth. This is my friend, Stephen Mansfield. Stephen, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. If you Google Steve Mansfield, you'll see the hundreds of books. Did you write one this morning on your way in? The darkness doesn't win. The light fails. The darkness doesn't win. The light fails. We're not in this mess because of political policies. We didn't get here because the government did this or that. We're here because the church forgot Jesus. The darkness doesn't win. The light fails. I wish there was a time in this service for me to go and look at you eyeball to eyeball, face to face. Now, there's not time. And secondly, it would scare most of you to death. But I'd really want to ask you, do you know Jesus Christ? Not do you know about him, that's different. But do you know him? Are you the citizens of two kingdoms? I'd want to know how I could pray for you wherever God has put you. And I'd want you to understand how important it is for in your corner of darkness for you to be that candle that pushes the darkness back. Brentwood Baptist Church is called to engage the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody. And more than anything, we want to make sure you know that. We want you to know the love of Christ. Our ministers will be waiting for you out in the parlor and around in the vestibule atrium area. You'll find them. They want to continue this conversation. They want you to know Christ for yourself. Perhaps Christ is calling you to come to be part of Brentwood Baptist Church. You come. We'd love for you to be part of our journey in serving God in this great community. However the Lord has come to you now, He's waiting for you where you are. The church will wait for you as you come. Let's stand now as we pray together. Lord Jesus, we pray in this coming week that our good works will give evidence of your presence in this place. 
Every heart is now open, every life before you. So we pray now the choices we make are exactly what you want.